involvement of the youth in cybercrime, and the susceptibility of our ministries, departments, and agencies to grant corruption. The idea of computer-related fraud for our youth, especially those in tertiary institutions, is deeply concerning. So too, it's what appears like a pushback against the enforcement actions of the Commission by the youth themselves and managers of some of our institutions. The danger of having a tribe of future leaders whose outlook in life is that of fraud and corruption are the stairways to fame and fortune is, however, too dire to treat with kid gloves. In the same vein, extreme vulnerability of our MDAs to corruption has led to resource amplifiers and attendant negative impact on the nation's development. Both trends easily provoke a pose of questions. How do we prevent government agencies from becoming endless conduits for the theft of public funds? How do we get our youth to shun cyber crimes and follow the narrow path of honor and integrity? How do managers of tertiary institutions produce graduates that are truly certified, fit in learning and character? What help can the society learn to the academia in nurturing these young stars. There are no easy answers to these questions, but I believe the managers of our academic institutions are central to the quest for answers to some of the concerns. Our invitation of vice chancellors, rectors, and provosts of Nigerian universities, polytechnics, and colleges of education as participants in this engagement is therefore strategic. It is our view that the academia can contribute more in the anti corruption fight through mentorship as youth in today's fast-paced world need close supervision to navigate their path to success and purposeful living. I share this with you. Um, in my three months in office, we have recorded about 747 convictions. And it's so sad that a substantial portion of that conviction has to do with cybercrime, the involvement of youth, about 60% of our convictions. Now, if we have 60% of our youth, of our number of our convictions that have to do with cyber crimes and involvement of youth, that poses a great uh, concern to us as, as a people. In the long run, in the long term, developing and infusing anti-corruption courses for curriculum could be the game changer as a deliberate program of reorientation for this demographic. This will be more productive than the current tendency towards finger pointing over the embarrassing issue of student involvement in fraud. What the delegate situation calls for is consensus, consensus building and joining of forces to tackle a problem that threatens the future of our youth and the collective destiny of our nation. This tax, in my estimation, will be more, made much easier with the intervention of other institutions whose moral authority compels respect and reverence. No other institution feels this better than the religious bodies. This is the motivation for bringing leading figures from the academia and the clergy for this unique rubbing of minds. We are persuaded that religious leaders and institutions can offer help as a sounding board of integrity and transparency. Our belief in the potential of faith in anti corruption led the Commission to develop the Interfaith Manual, a preaching and teaching guide for Christians and Muslims. These documents are before us today and will be formally presented shortly. We are optimistic that using these resources, the major religious will be, religious will be in better stead to address the integrity and moral deficit that we find in our society. To our faith leaders, my appeal is that those who lead our society from churches and mosques should develop messages that glorify industry, that glorify hard work, that glorify integrity, probity, contentment over a little quest for wealth. Irrespective of how it was made, we all must stand up and be counted in the effort to reset the mentality of our youth that the first lane to affluence is fraud. No, we should change that, their mentality. Therefore, I'd like to plead very specially to our religious leaders. It's so saddening that I stand before this uh, eminent uh, audience today, that the, the, our experience in fighting corruption that have to do that involve religious leaders and uh, even traditional rulers is nothing to write home about. As I'm standing before you, there is a matter we are handling 
a parallel pyramid scheme of over that involved with over 30 billion naira, fleeced from Nigerians. Along the lines, some people died, some victims, you know, collapsed and all of that. We were able to trace about seven over seven billion to a particular religious body. And so what did I do? I said, look, write a letter to the leader of that religious sect. We did. And the next thing we saw was uh, a restraining order. The money traced to that religious organization to, to, to their leaders. We got a restraining order stopping us from inviting them, stopping us from recovering the money. Meanwhile, people have died along the line. Money traced directly to your body. And that's what we are battling. Of course, we have, we have appealed. And now this is the situation, the situation that is facing us. Religious leaders, religious bodies. When I was chief of staff, we investigated the issue of money laundering. Somewhere in this country, there's a particular religion, a sect, that laundered money for terrorists. Laundered money for terrorists. They just failed. And these are the problems that we are battling with. Ladies and gentlemen, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, aside from our commitment to using faith to tax corruption in various levels of society, we have also developed a remarkable tool which we intend to deploy to prevent corruption in our FDAs. This tool is, the, is called the Fraud Risk Control Project. Now, this is not a, a replica of what our sister agency, ICBC, is doing, which, is basically, which basically has to do with uh, uh, the system study review. Now, what we are trying to do is to take it further. System study review is good, but what are we doing with the report? So we are not just going to stop as fraud risk assessment for the MDAs. We have gotten approval of the president that we should set a, a, a matrix, a, what we call the first risk control. So when we set the template, once you go below the threshold, we will not allow the money to be stolen. We come in and begin to investigate. It costs less to prevent uh, than to recover. That's the essence of the fraud risk assessment project we are going to embark on. Now, which is also being unveiled today, is meant to assist government agencies to address systemic vulnerabilities at the personnel, institutional, and environmental levels and take preemptive measures. When fully developed, to save the nation billions of naira in stolen wealth, time and resources spent in investigating and grand corruption cases, the project is intended to commence in the first instance with 20 extremely vulnerable agencies of government. And uh, I'd like to pray the indulgence of His Excellency, sir, that uh, one of the institutions I've penciled down is the State House itself. So we are going to start our funding assessment from, at the villa. When we leave the villa, we are going to the National Assembly. We are going to the National Assembly Service Commission. We, are, we want to look into what they are doing there, their contract and procurement and what process. When we leave that place, we are going to the Federal Judicial Service Commission as well. Uh, so we're going to balance it before we start talking about the, the ministries. I have been trying to, to look out for the Honorable Minister of Works here. Yeah, he's not here, but after those three uh, four areas, we are going to the Ministry of Works. We are looking at those who take the large chunk of our budget. We want to see what they do with that money going forward. Finally, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, permit me to commend the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, President Bola Ahmed Tinubu, for his unflinching support to the fight against corruption in Nigeria. With the political will of the administration, I believe that we have a golden opportunity to rewrite the story of our nation's public, our nation's quest for improved transparency and accountability in public affairs. We can make this moment count by stepping up cooperation and collaboration. It is the least we can do for our ourselves. ourselves. When the VP is sitting there, bring it. Thank you, Your Excellency. 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 Thank you, Your Excellency